very happy to, um, to see so many people attending. It's a pleasure every time to, to see that there's so much interest for research and especially the research frontier. And today we will be at that particular frontier in condensed matter physics. But I'm happy to introduce Jaislav Gupta as our colloquium or lecture speaker today. And he will speak about reduction of some bright stacks. Star Wars theme. Yes. So Jason Booker is an assistant professor here at MBI, and he received a PhD from Slovenia when he was at Oxford as a, a postdoc and just received a Willem Young Investigator Grant. So he's running his own group and his own research program. So he's worked on, on many different questions, often the, 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 the special questions that we want to understand in, in condensed matter physics. And um, a lot of it is focused on non-equilibrium physics, so physics that are not in equilibrium and in quantum many body system. This is a very interesting topic with many applications, among other things, for quantum technologies and, and future applications. So we will hopefully hear much more about that in the talk. So please welcome Jason Uka. So thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much for the nice, the very nice introduction and for inviting me to give this talk. So unfortunately, I will have to disappoint a bit. There are many. Uh, uh, I was thinking when I was asked uh, to present this talk, I was thinking what kind of uh, talk I should give. So most people working in my field will tell you things about like quantum computing or quantum mechanics in general. Let's say. Uh, uh, these types of belt inequality type experiments where you have quantum entanglement, et cetera, quantum computing type applications. Uh, but, and you can find many, many great talks like that online, but I decided to do something a bit different, right? So something that's usually not done. So this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so good luck to all of us, yeah? <laughs> and uh, I decided to take a more philosophical bend. So I, one very important concept in physics that even though physicists would never admit, we kind of have always in the back of our minds, even though we kind of think it's, well, there are problems with it, is reductionism. So I will guide you through the uh, uh, history of physics and its attempts to deal with this concept, yeah, apply it to, to our understanding of the world, of nature. Only towards the end will I talk about some things I have done, in, in, uh, which is a work in progress, hence trying to, uh, in a sense, bring back reductionism, if you will. If you like philosophically, that's what I'm trying to do, and hence the title. In any case, uh, the, uh, like I said, so I will be discussing mostly historically physics, yeah, also slightly touch on philosophically what this means, uh, what reductionism means. Okay, so I hope you will enjoy the talk. The plan is I will, the first part will be roughly, hopefully 45 minutes. Then we'll have a bit of a break, 15 minutes, then half an hour and then uh, questions, okay? Right, so let me use my pointer and uh, start. Okay, so modern physics, yeah. We have to start with Galileo or either Galileo, depends on who you ask, or Newton. But the general idea is, the general idea of physics, which is not obvious, which is maybe obvious to us now after we went through all of the, all of the education we did, yeah, is that there are properties of the world, um, of the world that we perceive, so not the world of, you know, metaphysical world, but the world that we perceive that can be quantified, which means that they can be expressed as a number, or more precisely, a ratio. So what do I mean by a ratio? Well, when I say that something is two meters long, what do I mean by this? Well, I mean it's just twice as long as something that's one meter long. So I always have to specify a ratio in the sense that what I'm saying, uh, what I'm quantifying is really s some number times some other thing, yeah. So but that's not that important, but I would like to keep you in mind because, you know, once for units and so on, okay? And importantly, and there are, this is 
really the crucial understanding that's not so obvious, yeah, is that there are certain mathematical equalities between these quantities that we may, in the world that we perceive, that must be universally correct. And moreover, these mathematical equalities can be used to predict other properties, other quantities that we do not necessarily know. And this is the general idea of physics. And the general idea of science has been put very succinctly in his uh, eclectic style by very, very uh, famous physicist Richard Feynman, who said, if it agrees with experiments, it's wrong. And in that simple statement is the key to science, indeed. So that's it. So you can say whatever you like in science, but if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. You can never really be right in science. That's another interesting thing. There's no right statement. There's only a statement that's not proven to be wrong by experiment. OK, now let's start with Newton. So what did, uh, let me you probably know this, or probably remember this, these are Newton's laws. So let me begin at the beginning, and I will now review them very, very uh, briefly. Okay, so uh, what do they do? Well, they tell us, for example, how to compute dynamics, movement. Remember, if I use the word dynamics, I mean the movement of particles or other objects, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so what are these laws? Well, the f there's the first law, yeah, and it tells us that uh, it tells it makes a statement about velocities of objects. Now, uh, velocities are quantities that have a magnitude, that is some number, and a direction. Okay, so there's a direction and there's a number. Now, Newton's first law says. If a body is at rest or in motion at a constant speed along a straight line, unless it is acted by, uh, upon by a force. Okay, so if there's no force, an object will just move at the same velocity, yeah. Okay, uh, Newton's second law is uh, when a body is acted upon by a force, the time rate, ch the uh, time rate, so the change in time, how fast it changes in time, its momentum equals the force. So a force is something abstract, but you can essentially say this is the definition of what the force is. So, uh, okay, momentum, never mind. So the D means, what does it mean? Well, it means DP means just a very small change in P and a very small change in T. Or if you like, if the mass of the object doesn't change, then it's just the force acting on an object is the mass times the acceleration. That's Newton's second law. And Newton's third law says if two bodies exert forces on each other, these forces have the same magnitude but opposite direction. This is sometimes stated for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, but uh, this is a misleading, yeah? So again, going back to Feynman, it just means that there are, there's a pair of forces that uh, acts between two objects, right? There's, there's no action, reaction means that there's a, there one object acts first then the other one reacts. No, it, it's simultaneously happening, yeah. Right, okay, so uh, let's, I would like to, you to keep this in mind. It's, it will not be important for the rest of the talk, but maybe it's useful for you to uh, 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 be aware of this because uh, it's, often misunderstood in, in this sense, yeah. Okay, um, okay, like Feynman says, we have two bodies, and the first one exerts a second, second one, certain force, then simultaneously, the second particle or the second body will push on the first one with equal force in opposite direction, yeah. Okay, now uh, these laws, there are three laws, yeah. And in principle, from these three laws, we can get the entire uh, dynamics of any collection of particles that we like, in principle. Uh, this in principle will be crucial. Let's say uh, we have a collection of particles. For instance, particles, I mean any object that is uh, composite and does not uh, fall apart. Yeah? There's, as far as we care, there's no smaller constituent objects whose dynamics we need to track. So for instance, I, I use, particle and uh, 
object interchangeably. This is because if I think of a planet, which is an object, I can think of it as the same a particle unless it falls apart. Yeah, it's just one thing. That's, that's, yeah. OK, uh, so let's consider a collection of such particles or objects. Now, if we know uh, what the forces are that acting between them, yeah. So, for instance, gravity, electric force. We these these forces in Newton's terms have a known expression, yeah. And then we can use Newton's second law, more specifically, to write down the equations, so-called equations of motion, which, if you can solve, which are from this coming from Newton's second law. If you can solve, you essentially know what the how the particles move will move in any instant of time, and this is what I will mean. Now I would like to keep I would like you to keep these two concepts in mind when it comes to uh, sol solving these equations. Analytical solutions, so x one of t, x two of t, so the one and two indexes a position of particle one, position of particle two, etc. And you can, since we're in three-dimensional space, these are actually, this is not one number, these are all, tri this is a, a triplet of numbers. So x direction, y direction, and z direction. Yeah. So that's how you specify a position of a particle. And if we have an analytical solution, then these are functions that we can evaluate for any t. So I give you, a, give you the expression. You want to say, I want to know when the, where the particles will be at time t equals five minutes. We just plug in five minutes, and it's, you immediately can evaluate the number. Now, there's another way to solve the equations. And that is, uh, we begin where the particles were at time equals 0. Yeah, we know where they are. And then we evaluate where they are using Newton's laws in the next, uh, in the next not really instant of time, but very, very small number. Change, num time change, yeah. And then we do that, and then we repeat, 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 and then we will get a series of numbers that will tell us approximately where the particles are, given that they were first initially uh, somewhere that we you know where they were. Okay, so for instance, analytical solution is g times t squared plus x1 of zero. So this is where it was in the beginning. t squared is the time, and g is some constant, it's called in this case, it would be like acceleration, but never mind. It's just an example. OK, now if I want to know where particle 1 is at time t, I just plug in t, whatever t I like, and immediately uh, I get some solution. And if I want to know where it is, uh, if it started off somewhere else, I just change this number. OK. Now if I want to do a numerical solution, I do the following. So let's say, I, OK, now I'm going to assume that my particle started off at position 0 0.4 meters, which is distance from something, and it initially had this velocity. Yeah. OK, and now I have to evaluate using Newton's laws where it is, for instance, uh, 0 0.01 seconds later. And then I will approximately, and I can do that, and then I can approximate, get an approximate position of where it is uh, 0 0.01 seconds later, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Up to some time, I care about. And if I want to do it for another uh, position, initial position, so where it started, I have to repeat the same process over and over again. So this is why analytical solutions are kind of, as you can see, easier to use, and why we kind of, uh, in physics in general, like to have analytical solutions more than numerical. But okay, taking back, uh, taking a step in the philosophical direction. So what is reductionism and what does it have to do with Newton's laws anyway? Yeah. So I'm going to quote Descartes, one of the people who was uh, big on reductionism. Yeah. So it is uh, essentially the idea is, OK, it's, uh, this is a long block of text, so I can give you time to read. But essential idea is that there is order there is some sort of order and arrangement in very complex things that we can understand. So complex meaning that contain many, 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 many things. Yeah, very complex, essentially in everything. And that there is some method that we can use that allows us to understand these complex things, their behavior, their properties, etc. 
from the properties of their constituent parts. And these properties and behavior of their constituent parts, so the things that make them up, for instance, like particles, behave in a simpler way than these complex things. So all of this simplicity of all of these simpler, simpler parts can allow us to completely understand the behavior of complex things. Yeah? And this is due to Descartes, so this is this idea of a duck. So I, if I want to understand the duck, I can understand the duck as some sort of machine that has gears, right? And if I understand how these gears behave, what they do, uh, some type of machine, I can understand what the duck does. Yeah, this is like a typical example of, I mean, I would say this is maybe even the symbol for reductionism, okay? Now, what does this have to do with physics? Well, uh, now you can see Newton's laws, they're very simple, but in principle, one could use them to compute anything we like, in principle, provided they're correct. They're not, but you'll see that in, a, in <laughs> later in the talk. But let's assume they're correct and they completely describe the behavior of all uh, particles, yeah? So if I want to know what something does, I can just um, use them and compute each individual particle what it will do, and I will know what the whole thing does. So for instance, if you want to know what I will say next, you scan, see all the particles in my body, and then use Newton's laws to see what I'll say next, yeah? Because what I'll say next will be determined by the, I don't know, I guess my neurons and whatever, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, uh, uh, this, this kind of simple idea, this simple fact was so obvious to, Noted mathematician and physicist as well. Okay, it's uh, back in the days difficult to distinguish who was a mathematician, who was a physicist. It was more or less the same thing. But uh, anyway, Laplace said, thought that if you have an intellect who could know at a certain moment all the forces in nature, and in principle, back in the day, they thought they did, and all the positions of all the particles in the universe, such an intellect could simply use Newton's laws to compute the entirety of the future of the universe, right? So everything in it, yeah? And in principle, this was, this was uh, the, the power of these Newton's laws in this sense, and their simplicity allowed people to, uh, to think that, you know, reductionism is clearly okay. Okay, so uh, for instance, one major triumph was solving motion of the of a planet and a star. Yeah, well, that's one major. It is like the so-called two-body problem. Okay, give you an example. We have a we have a star. Initially, it has it has some position x one, and we have a planet that has position x two, which changes in time. And we want to know how it changes in time. Okay, and now we know that they start at some point at t equals zero. Yeah, t equal, what we put to zero is arbitrary. We can put any instant of time to be zero. And we know their velocities at that point of time. And now we can find, using Newton's laws, we can find uh, where they will be for all the entirety of the future, yeah? Provided that the universe consists of nothing but the star and the <laughs> planet. <coughs> and we use Newton's laws. Hold on. I'm stepping back here so you can see. This is just, so we say, okay, the acceleration. So when I put delta here, just to imagine small change over small change. So small change in velocity over the small change in time equals uh, the force between the star and planet. This is their distance, and this is, these are their masses, m1, m2. And this is, a, this is a constant that's universally always the same, yeah? Okay, and the other thing, Newton's third law says are equal opposite, yeah? So minus, that's also minus, that's for the planet. And then we know and velocity is uh, defined again as a small change of position in a small change of time, that's how we define the velocity. And there exists an analytical solution to this problem. I will not show you the solution. It's not important, but you just imagine that it exists, right? So I'm taking a philosophical bent. Note that nothing I say will be in any shape, form, or very useful. But uh, now there are some first cracks. So okay, but here now historically people say, okay, this is amazing. We can solve uh, 
two body problem. Let's try three body. Why, why not? Two planets and a star, or three planets and a star. That's four body problem. But anyway, n body problem. And uh, people already ran into problems. So the three body problem is analytically not solvable. In, in actually, you can uh, even prove this. You cannot find closed form expressions in general for a three body problem. Well, not prove, but there are good arguments why this is not solvable. So we cannot do that analytically. Yeah? So uh, we can do it numerically. So we can follow the step-by-step -step procedure that I described where I mean numerical solution. So you take like uh, position, 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 evolve, position, position. You get new position, then you evolve, evolve, evolve. Time, so you take this little small time step like uh, change in time, delta t, and then for each delta t that you grow, the t, you make uh, you take next instance of time, next instance of time, and so on. You can do it like this. But even this has a problem. And why? Well, it was kind of understood before, but it came really into it, the issue that attracted lots of attention in the 20th century. And this led to the downfall of reductionism in physics. Okay. So Newton's laws uh, are uh, what people refer to as nonlinear equations. So I will describe what that means and why th this is a problem, why there being nonlinear is a problem for reductionism. Well, okay, so uh, nonlinear equations tend to be very sensitive to the initial conditions. Initial conditions, remember, we have in order to solve Newton's equations, we need to specify where the particles start off, yeah? So what, does, what do I mean by linear? Well, a linear function is defined by this property. So if I have a function, remember a function is something that takes any number and gives you a new number. So that's a function. So for instance, this is a function. f of x is 3x, yeah? So for instance, uh, if you put here 0 0.1, this will give you 3 times 0 0.1 or 0 0.3, yeah? So that's a function. And a linear function is such that f of x plus y equals f of x plus f of y. This is what we mean by linear, okay? Uh, and you can easily check that this is linear, that this property holds. So for instance, you take f of two pi plus three, which is five, you get three times five, which is 15, yeah? Because three times five. And let's compare, so let's compare. So this was two, this was three, two, three, f of two, is three times two, which is six, and f of three is three times three, which is nine. And indeed, 15 equals six plus nine. So it's linear. Here's an example of a nonlinear function, x squared. Let's see that it's indeed not, doesn't satisfy this property. Again, let's take f of two plus three, so f of five. Five squared is 25. And now let's compare f of two, yeah? So what's f of two? f of two is two squared, which is four, and f of three is three squared, which is nine. So four plus nine equals 13. So it's not the same. This is not a linear function. So what does this have to do with sensitivity to initial conditions? Well, if you have a linear function, you will at least, you are at least guaranteed that if you start, say, if you have this, as your initial condition and this as your initial condition, their difference is small. So this will not be arbitrarily amplified. So it will just be the value of the function for this very small number. This is not true in general for nonlinear. And I will, now you'll see in a second what this means. And I will give you the prototypical example of, uh, of, 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 uh, of a map we call it the map. It takes a set of numbers, gives you a new set of numbers, and then it takes that set of numbers, gives you a new set of numbers. This is like numerically solving uh, Newton's equations of uh, Newton's equations for particles. But uh, it's not. It doesn't. This this logistic map does not follow directly from Newton's equation. It's just a, it's just a useful example of the same kind of problem we encounter when we do solve numerically Newton's equations. If you remember, analytically, we can only solve two body problems. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit sad we can't do much analytically, but okay. 
OK, so let's move to discrete time. So we call discrete time, again, finite intervals of time like we do when we solve numerically. And let's see what happens. So for instance, let's see what happens in year n plus 1. It's a, a year is a, my discrete unit of time. If we know what the value of some x is in year n. So and this is the equation that we will follow. So what does this equation actually do if it doesn't follow from Newton's laws? Well, it models things in uh, various things. It models things when something grows exponentially, but up to some maximum value. So for instance, uh, population of rabbits. So population of rabbits. What is the population of rabbits in year n plus 1 if the population was x of n in year n? Okay, and you clearly... Uh, what percent of the animal population? Yeah, so clearly the, 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 what percent of the animal populations are rabbits? That's what, that's what we want to find out. Clearly zero is the minimum, so there are zero percent of rabbits. And one is the maximum, all the animals are rabbits, 100% of the animals. And this is the equation this, the rabbit population will follow. It seems very simple. So let's say, what does it mean? Okay, so for instance, if we, in year zero, we have 20% of the population being rabbits, and their growth rate, which is this r, this, you, you, you don't, you, the equation does not tell you what, how fast they multiply. Let's say if it was two. So this, the growth rate being two means that uh, two rabbits will have on average uh, four babies. So then next year you will have times two, yeah, four babies. No, wait, two, two babies, so you have four in the end. Okay, um, right, so we now plug it in. So growth rate is two, we start at 0 0.2, 0 0.2 times two, times one minus 0 0.2, and then in year one, if that was in year zero, we get 32%, so we get more rabbits now, okay? Well, more rabbits in the animal population. Okay. So uh, that's the logistics map. So what's the problem? Well, let's see. Let's see if we, we're going to start. Let's say initially 0 0.3 was the population of the rabbits. And then we'll compare to the case if we, let's say we don't, we don't know how many actually, we cannot count all the rabbits. They hide in holes. We miss one or few, we miss a few, couple of rabbits, yeah? And then let's say our error is our error, this is like the actual population of rabbits, but we, our error is like on here on the second decimal one, yeah? And now we want to compare how our predictions will match to the real value if our error was of this level, so just here. And let's see, let's compare. Okay, so, okay, we're okay. Ah, look, already in year eight, logistic map gives us quite different answers if we started here and then we started here. So already here in year 15, there's absolutely no connection between these two values. They are more or less look completely <laughs> un unrelated in any sense, yeah. So even, okay, but then you can say, okay, but reductionism, okay, I see how this is a problem for reductionism. Clearly, I cannot use Newton's laws to compute nonlinear things with, uh, unless I can make the thing very, very precise. Yeah, initial value, very, very precise. Okay, let's try making more precise. Let's say that the error is, I, I cannot even count this high, I'm a mathematical physicist. Yeah. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven decimals. The error is on the seventh decimal. Let's see what happens. Okay, so we're okay for the first, we're okay up to year 10. 12 is okay, 14, 16, uh-huh. 20, oh no, 25 already, there's absolutely no connection. Yeah? And indeed, this sensitivity to initial conditions is not uh, just a property of the logistics map. It's a very general property of, uh, of all of nonlinear non dynamics, if you will, such as the one you get by Newton's laws, okay? And indeed, uh, it also appears in the three-body problem. The tree body problem is unsolvable in this sense. So we can use it to, if we can use, if we have very, very extreme precision, we can, if we can pr approximately get where tree bodies will be up to some long time. But if for all time, as Laplace would like, no. So, 
not just it's not just that we have a, we'll have an enough the, that our computers are not powerful enough. It's simply because any minuscule error will be arbitrarily amplified after a long time. Yeah, this better computers will not help you there. Yeah. But it's even worse. So if we want to do like uh, Descartes, you want to figure out the dynamics of a duck, or and I'm going to switch to cat because I like cat better. Uh, so in order to figure out what a cat will do from its microscopic particle behavior, we don't have to solve three body problem. We have to solve 10 to the 26th body problem, yeah? So that's one and 26 zeros, okay? Of each individual atom plus the electron, the electron, and then you have the nucleus. So it's, yeah, there's no way, right? Or is there? Well, it's kind of like uh, saying, okay, look at this beautiful motion. This is called murmuration, by the way. I don't know if you ever see this. Birds tend to do this. For instance, here's a flock of starlings. They do this thing here. It's crazy. Anyway, uh, it's like trying to figure out what the whole flock will do if we just look at how, uh, look at, let's look, we know what this, this one bird, what the laws are for it. Okay, uh, that, that won't help us much. You know? So it seems like a very difficult problem. But it gets worse in the 20th century, it gets worse for reductionism. Uh, you will see that actually we cannot, that's not the only problem. <laughs> that, there's an even deeper problem. Uh, and that, this general understanding of this deeper problem and its solution comes under the name quantum mechanics and, or quantum physics or so quantum something, yeah? And I am here uh, in the same lecture room, one of the main people, probably the first person who understood quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr lectured. So I am uh, very much uh, in awe of this, but okay, so quantum mechanics. It's not just uh, the small components, the particles. They don't, Newton's laws aren't right. Uh, they don't uh, follow Newton's laws, yeah? So electrons, etc., atoms, they don't follow. Each, uh, one electron does not follow Newton's laws. An atom does not follow Newton's laws. In fact, what they do, what electrons and atoms do, is uh, unlike anything we can really imagine. It's not just, you know, that we have lack of our imagination, is that our brains evolved under laws that are approximately described by Newtonian physics, yeah? We, our brains cannot comprehend what electrons and uh, atoms really do, yeah? We don't even have a word. Do is, uh, do is perhaps even the wrong word to use, yeah? So, uh, so I did not, I'm, I'm kind of assuming you know what this means. Deterministically means if I have X and there's a, there's a law that tells me what Y is. That's what I mean. So always for something, you always get something, determinism. Yeah. So Newton's laws are deterministic because they say if you have a particle with velocity V, in X instance of time, if, doesn't, if a force doesn't act on it, it's going to stay V. So that's deterministic. But uh, it, uh, the particles actually, even one particle, so not, not problem two, three particles, it's one particle, do not behave deterministically. In fact, they behave like nothing we have ever seen before. And I will tell you about that. Of course, uh, quantum mechanics, the way our, uh, our uh, human brains can understand is the only way we can understand is via mathematics. So I cannot, I don't know what to go into this, yeah? cannot go into this, it's impossible in, in a short lecture. <coughs> but uh, I'll try to explain using analogy and contrast to things we, we are kind of familiar with, yeah? So analogy, I'll tell you this is something like something, and contrast, I will tell you this is not like that something else, okay? So for instance, analogy with particles and waves. And the particles that are very, very small, that follow the laws of quantum physics, yeah? Uh, it's not that they're just small, it's a few of them. One electron, a few electrons, yeah? Uh, will be either electrons or photons. I'm gonna focus on electrons, but if you like photons, particles of light, you can think of them, okay? Okay, so let's begin by this analogy. So let's take, um, let's say we have uh, a gun, a machine gun, yeah? 
And there's a machine gun here, depicted by this uh, 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 blue thing. Yeah. And the machine gun fires bullets, but it's, they didn't position it very well, so it's a bit shaky. Yeah, so it shakes. So it fires bullets at random. And now you take armor plating, you put armor plating here, but you put two slits or holes here in the armor plating. So this is an experiment we're going to do. And finally, you put another set, another armor plate here. And now what's going to happen? Well, and now on the armor plate, let's say we also put some bags of sand throughout. So we can count uh, how many bullets there are in a bag of sand when our experiment is done. OK, now we turn on this thing. It's going to shake and fire bullets. OK? And the uh, thing that we were going to quantify, that again, physics is called the quantities, measuring and uh, giving, it, giving numbers, will be the number of bullets that we detect. OK, so let's say you do this for an hour. Then you uh, 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 count the number of bullets you get here, here, here. You can make this as precise as you like by making the bags of sand smaller. Here, here, here. Here, 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 yeah. And uh, if both slits are open, we will look at yeah. either one, one slit is closed, the other is closed, or both are open. And the relevant quantity will be the number of bullets being detected in unit of time. So for instance, one minute. Yeah? So let's say we do it for an hour. And then we divide by 60 to get how many on average will be uh, detected in a minute. OK, one thing to notice first the properties of bullet. What is a bullet? Well, for me, let's say a bullet is something that like comes in a lump. So it's one lump. It's all the same, and all the bullets are the same. So one thing I will see is you always, you always find one bullet. So the bullets are perfect. They don't, let's say they're very good. They don't break up. Yeah? You always find one bullet, always one, the same bullet. Moreover, you will never detect the same bullet at two points at the same time. Yeah? So it's the number of bullets is an integer. Yeah? So 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, etc. But the number of bullets per hour or per minute can be a, a rational number. So for instance, two and a half bullets per minute means that for two minutes on average, you're going to detect um, five bullets. So this is clearly. Uh, because this is random, this, the end result will also be random. So we say this is a probability distribution as well. So what do we see? Well, if both slits are open, we see something like this. Yeah? So there's fewer bullets in the middle. But very close to both slits, there's lots of bullets. Yeah? And in fact, what, that's what we see is if we close one slit, this is the probability distribution we get. And if we close the other slit, this is the probability distribution we get. and we can verify by experiment our intuition is that since the bullet either passes through this slit or this slit, and if this slit is closed, it can only pass through this slit, the number of bullets detected when both slits are open equals the number of bullets detected when one slit is open and plus the number of bullets detected when the other slit is open, which makes sense, yeah? Right? On average, of course. Remember, each individual thing will be... Uh, slightly different, each individual run of the machine gun, but on average, it will be true. OK. Uh, so that makes sense. OK. Let's look at something else that we're kind of familiar with, uh, waves. So for instance, water. So now I have the same type of you know, experiment. I have this thing with two slits. OK. And uh, now I have uh, water. And let's say I'm going to start here, pushing the water at regular intervals, boo, boo, boo. it's going to make regular waves that are going to spread out around my finger. OK, around my finger, it's going to reach these two slits. And then here, instead of uh, armor plating and, uh, and well, yeah, I use bag of, bags of sand, I'm going to put a buoy. A buoy is a thing that floats. And the relevant quantity will now, since this is uh, no longer dealing with bullets, the relevant quantity will be the intensity of the wave, which is essentially what we're saying, how much energy a wave has here or here or there. And I will measure this by, ha by having this buoy. The buoy will either go up and down. And how much the buoy goes up and down, this is essentially 
uh, the same as the energy of the wave there, yeah? So this little floating thing, yeah? This is not the same thing as the height of the wave. It's the energy that the wave carries. Okay, so there's this buoy, and what I will see, how high the buoy will go, will follow this pattern. So, okay, so I came in X, yeah, so this is, uh, will follow this pattern. So when both slits are open, it's gonna make this very uh, unusual mathematical curve whose properties are very well understood. It has interesting properties that aren't important for us, but it's gonna look like this. And this is called, we call this an interference pattern, okay? And if one slit is closed, again, uh, say this slit is closed, so I'm here I1, 2 is missing, here I1, I2, so the first time I give it this problem. So I1, 2, I1, I2, uh, so when one slit is closed, this will be the intensity pattern of the intensity of the wave, the other slit is closed, this will be one, okay? That's the energy. Okay, uh, and so I1, 2, clearly does not equal I1 plus I2. So uh, I'm gonna, this I missed to write, but I'm gonna write I1, 2 does not equal I1 plus I2, okay? B uh, like, unlike N1, 2 for the bullets equal N1 plus N2. Uh, however, there is another property which we call interference, and that is height. So height, height of the wave. Remember, it's not the same thing as the intensity. It actually turns out to be, the intensity turns out to be the square of the height. You can show this for waves. Trust me on this. Anyway, the intensity of uh, when the both slits are open equals it's the height of the waves squared. But I1, 2 does not equal I1 plus I2, but height 1, 2 equals height 1 plus height 2. This turns out to be true, okay? And this is interference. Okay, so what does it have to do with quantum physics at all? Well, okay, let me get there. So now we're gonna do a similar experiment, but instead of doing it with the bullets, we're gonna do it with electrons. So we're gonna have like, uh, an electron gun, yeah? You're just gonna turn it on, okay? Turn on, for instance, it can be, if you're old enough, you remember these old cathode ray televisions, you know, the big bulky thing? It has a cathode ray tube inside that accelerates electrons and fires them into a vacuum. And here we put some, I don't know, tungsten or something that's a good uh, conductor and gonna, when the electron hits, it's gonna absorb it, yeah? And here, likewise, we put some sort of detector, if you like. Uh, but I have voltmeters, okay, on this other plate. There's gonna be our detectors. The electron comes, it's gonna give us an electric signal. Okay. First thing we'll notice is the electrons, even though this is no longer shaky, will be fired at random, as you will see. But that's not important. Uh, well, it is, but uh, it's a f it, we cannot really, there's no, we can, try as we like, we cannot make them completely not fire at random. Okay, so now we have both slits open, and one thing we notice is electrons come in lumps, just like the bullets. So when we make this, let's say this electron gun fire at a very low rate, so we turn down the uh, uh, current, yeah, in the thing, it's gonna fire very, we're gonna hear only hear, let's say we, the voltmeter is also connected to out here. So we're gonna hear clicks, yeah? We hear clicks, click, click, click. The click is always the same, just like the bullets was always the same. There's no click and then click. There's all, they're all the same. Moreover, just like the bullets, we do not de detect two clicks at the exact same time, okay? So we take click, click, we never hear click, right? So electrons, like bullets, as far as we can say, come in lumps. They're like bullets. They're particles, if you like. Or bullets, or whatever, lumps. Uh, okay. Now, if both slits are open, since they're like bullets, what do you think the probability of finding an electron will look like? No. Well, oh, okay, they could not look like the same like the bullets. No, they look like the waves. Uh, and this is probability of having uh, 
finding an electron around this direction is the same, exact same pattern as the one we had for waves. So what does this mean? Let's think about it. Well, it means among other things, so if we turn on, a, if close one of the slits, again, the same pattern, close the other slit, the same other pattern, yeah? If you like, this is like the number of electrons we find per unit of time. And it doesn't, first they don't add. So what does this mean? Well, it means very strange things. So for instance, let's say we close this slit, okay? And then we have a large, very large probability of finding an electron here or somewhere, yeah, here, near the slit, let's say here. But if we open the other slit, okay, so just that's the only change we do. We open the other slit, the probability becomes extremely small, okay? So if we imagine what the electron is doing, it's somehow it kind of gets fired at random, goes through this slit, but then it comes back and checks whether this slit is open and then changes its mind, okay? So if you want to think in terms of what the electron is doing, it must somehow be able to check whether or not this slit is open or not, yeah? So it cares for some reason, okay? Uh, so, so is, so can you invent some rule that the electron, what the electron does actually co goes back and checks? Well, you can try, people have tried when they first understood what this means. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, as far as we can tell, any rule that we may try to use to guess what the electron does, how it checks the other slit, fails to reproduce the simplicity of this result. So it turns out uh, there the is this interference pattern, which is so simple and wave-like. So it turns out that there is the probability one, two, mathematically, the probability one, two is the square of something one, two. Yeah. This something is not something that we can actually see or measure or anything. And it's called the wave vector because we don't know what we can, yeah, you know, people, yeah, it's kind of like waves, so we call it wave vector. Wave vector, psi, and psi one two is equal to psi one plus psi two. And this is very simple mathematically. And if you want to invent some complicated rule to reproduce something so simple, you're gonna run into problems. Indeed, no one has been able to do so. But okay, you can say, okay, but surely there is some way to check what the electron does. Let's just look at it, okay? So, uh, yeah. So let's turn on a light. So we're just gonna turn on a light, essentially some source of light that's gonna look whether the electro, what the, did it come back, did it go through this hole, what did it do? Okay, so we have a source of light, and light, it turns out, are kind of, are, also comes in lumps, in photon lumps, okay? So think about that. So now we're gonna turn a light, and if we turn on a light, and if an electron goes through this slit, we're gonna see it because it's gonna, you know, shine up because of the light. They see it, okay, the electron is there. So we do that experiment, and what happens? Well, this happens now. Okay, now when we look at it, we're gonna see an electron goes through this hole, and of course, naturally, it's gonna end up here, and an electron goes through this hole, it's gonna end up here. And then the probabilities are just gonna be sums, again, just like for the bullets, okay? And uh, yeah, it kind of makes sense. What else can happen, right? If you see it, if you see it moves in a straight line as Newton would like, it's gonna move, 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 and then it's gonna hit here. And if it moves here, it's gonna move, move, and hit here, R roughly. It's kind of, the randomness is kind of this part, yeah? The spread of this, right? So what else can happen? Okay, you can say, oh, well, okay, so we destroyed the interference pattern by turning on the light. Clearly, the light has, is doing something to the electrons. It's gonna, it's affecting them in some way that's change, this destroying the interference pattern, their motion, they don't like to come back if you look at them, yeah? Um, okay, so let's, how can we go around this problem? Well, let's try making the light dimmer. Let's say making the light dimmer. We can do that, sure. And then what will happen? Well, remember, as I said uh, during the beginning of this slide, light also comes in lumps. So if I make the light dimmer, Actually, just less lumps of light photons 
will travel here. So if it's very dim, it's light will you for one electron that passes, yeah, you will not see it unless a photon hits it. So if you don't have enough photons, you can miss it passing, yeah. And now it turns out, what it turns out? Well, it turns out if you do that, then um, the electrons that you do see by with light will behave like bullets, and the ones you do not will display the interference pattern. So the total thing is bit somewhere in between the interference pattern and this, okay? Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so, <laughs> So what can we do? Is there a way to, uh, to go around this problem? Is there a way to see what the electron actually does? Yeah. Does it go through this slit? Or does it come back? Does it go through this slit? No. Turns out, actually, and this fact that we cannot know is a very deep principle uh, in physics. In this is the essence of quantum physics, yeah? So this is. This is the f full entirety of quantum physics. All other uh, examples, not electron guns, but whatever, uh, follow the same principle, yeah? all, all the entirety of quantum physics. Okay, so there is a fundamental uh, limit in knowing what an electron does. You cannot even say that the electron goes through this hole or that hole. It is because if it goes through this hole, if you think about it, it has to do the same thing as the bullet. And this was understood as the, as by Heisenberg as the uncertainty principle. So there is no way, to which can be stated in this terms of this experiment, there is no way for us to determine which hole the electron went through without destroying the interference pattern. Now, uh, you probably, there's probably, there's equivalent ways to state it, equivalent ways for other systems, but it's a basic character of nature, yeah? There's no way to tell. Okay, and this is very general. The probability of something happening is the square of something that we don't know what it is, call a wave vector, yeah? And the probability of several events happening is the sum of these two wave vectors, yeah? So we cannot even know, going back to our reductionist thing, uh, we cannot even know what one electron does. So what chance do we have of, you know, uh, <laughs> figuring out what 10 to the 26 electrons do? Well, there is, in this whole commotion, confusion, there is a glimpse of hope, but that will probably be after the break. So now, what's the time? Six, I cannot see. Uh, six, 10. So let's meet back in 15 minutes, okay? Okay, so uh, I hope you all had a nice break, and uh, let's continue. So before moving on to what hope there is for reductionism, let me first emphasize the uh, fact that, ascent, that there is no way, as far as we can see, in our little experiment with the electron gun, there is no measurement apparatus that is sensitive enough to detect uh, where the, through which slit the electron goes without destroying the interference pattern. This is, as far as we can see, as far as we can understand, not a um, fault of our measuring apparatus is not being good enough, right? It's any measuring apparatus you can think of and people have tried a long time and Bohr was the first one to really decidedly argue that you, there is no way even in principle to tell which, which slit the electron went through without destroying the interference pattern. It is a fact of nature, as we can see. In fact, as far as we can tell, if, if there is an interference pattern, we cannot even tell 
whether the electron went, it's not that we cannot tell through which slit the electron went through. It's not that it even went through any of the slits, yeah? So the, what the electron does or how it exists in what form, unless we measure it, we cannot even speculate, yeah? So it's really a fact of nature. Uh, okay, not just for the electron gun, for, for any quantum, any small enough thing that, or, or anything that has few, only a few number of particles, yeah? Okay, so what is the glimpse of hope for reductionism? Well, <coughs> time evolution, that is the dynamics of probability, or in this case, wave vectors, remember the thing we squared to get the probability, is linear. Okay. Um, moreover, the time evolution of how the wave vector changes is not random. So the prob it's always probabilistic, but the way this probability distributions change in time is not random. It's actually deterministic. And the way you see that it's linear, that it should be linear, is if you know, if you remember waves from uh, your previous education, you will know that waves, you know, heights of waves always add. This is true in space, but it also turns out to be true in time. So height plus height, essentially, it must be linear, the way they change in time, yeah, as well as the change in space. Okay, another way to see it, since we're dealing with probabilities, let's consider uh, tossing coins. So we have some probability of a coin landing heads and some probability of uh, its landing tails. These two probabilities must sum to one because, you know, they're, you can, it can either land up. So it, when we sum them, we test what is the probability of the coin either landing heads or landing tails. So it should be one, 100%, okay? Uh, now, this, if we change the coin probabilities in some way, let's say we bias the coin, this is our time evolution, so how it changes, yeah? Uh, the time evolution, after the time evolution, this probability of heads plus probability of tails after the time evolution should also be one, yeah? Because again, you, the sum of all possible events the probability of sum of all possible events must be one because there's nothing else that can happen, yeah? So it m summing probabilities means saying or. So is it land, what is the probability of it landing heads or landing tails? So it must be 100%. It must be either that or that, yeah? A perfectly thin coin, so it doesn't want that, yeah? Won't land on the edge or anything. <coughs> okay, now you can convince yourself, if you try a bit, if this is true, if, the time evolution is linear, and moreover, the time evolution of probability 100% is 100%. So, this kind of hinting why it should be linear, I don't, I will not show you why it's actually linear, but this kind of a hint why it should be linear. And indeed it is. So, time evolution, dynamics, time evolution, how the wave vector changes in time is linear and not random. Okay, one thing that may be puzzling, how can this, uh, all of this probabilistic random behavior of electrons lead to Newton's laws, which we know to be correct for, for well, to a enormous accuracy for systems that have lots of particles, okay? They're deterministic, okay? If an object is uh, not acted upon by a force, it's gonna move with the same velocity, that's deterministic. And yet each electron we know is probably, is doing random stuff, yeah? So how can this happen? <coughs> well, it will turn out uh, there is some way for the Newton's laws to emerge from the quantum laws, yeah? Governing the individual particles. Uh, to show you how this happens, again, I will have to use an analogy. I will not show you how it is done. In fact, in general, it is in dif very difficult to do. Uh, how exactly this, how exactly Newton's laws emerge for big systems from the microscopic quantum law. So I will use an analogy. Again, not with laws, but with coins. So a coin toss is random. Yeah? So a coin toss, let's say we have an ideal coin. It will land heads or tails with probability of one half, yeah, 0 0.5. And uh, this is like having a quantum random particle. 
Now imagine we have lots of coins. So this was like having lots and lots of particles, yeah? And now let's assign <coughs> to, um, to the face value of uh, heads plus one and to tails a value of zero. So if we add, so if we land heads, a co one of these coins, we say it's plus one. If it lands on tails, we say it's zero. Okay, so and now the question, which is analogous to asking where the system of many particles, what it's doing, is uh, <coughs> what is the average value of the face in the entire system of coins? Yeah? This is like uh, asking what the global property of a system of many particles is. Yeah? Because if you have a collection of particles and you say the system, the position of this system is actually the average position of all the particles inside. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's do that. Okay, so let's perform this coin toss randomly. So we have lots of coins, we're sampling some number of coins. As you can see, the more and more we sample, the closer it will be to the actual average value, which it should be one half, right? Okay, so I skipped a bit ahead. But okay, so um, yeah, so you can see it's kind of the more coins we have, it's going to go to one half. So, in fact, the, if, if we have an enormous amount of coins, it's going to be one half up to extremely great precision. So we know, even though we don't know what each individual coin is doing, yeah, what's its face value, with collection on average, the more coins they have is close, very, very close to one half. Yeah? So this is kind of a type of determinism. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now remember... In fact, moreover, going to the cat, we want to figure out what the cat does, what's its dynamics, yeah, where it's going, is it, does it want to eat, is it uh, happy or whatever, uh, does it want to play. <coughs> so we do not care really about the motion of every single atom in the cat, okay. Um, now, uh, there will be another thing that will help us to figure out what the cat does, and this thing is called the conservation law. It comes from a symmetry. So uh, let's see what it means. So uh, let's say we have, the, we have some uh, enormous collection of particles that are initialized with random velocity. So each particle has a random velocity. So this is mimicking our randomness in, in our uh, quantum mechanical setting. And they, we now release these particles and allow them to move. And if they collide, they will bounce back. Okay, so they collide, they bounce back. But they collide in a way that, some, that something is conserved. So and this something is called the momentum, or if you will, the total velocity. So when you sum up all the particles, you let them uh, move, collide, and then in another instant of time, you sum up the velocities of all the particles, and this number is the same. So this is a conservation law. And this is a fact of nature, as far as we can say. And I will discuss why briefly, but OK. So let's, let's try doing this, okay? So we have some collection of particles with random velocities, and we allow them to move, yeah? So what we can see? Well, okay, they're colliding, they're moving, they're expanding, but if you kind of, you can already see by eye, so I didn't plot the graph to show that, but the average position of each particle, the position of this whole blob, even though it grows, it doesn't move because the total initial velocity was zero, okay? And indeed, there are many such conservation laws in nature that are fundamental, and this was understood by Emmy Neuter to follow from symmetry. So there are very deep principles in physics that I can only tell you in words. I cannot tell you why they are true. The reason they are true is uh, mathematical, but they sound very nice, so I'm going to tell them. Yeah. So <coughs> let's say, so for instance, a symmetry means if we have our laws of physics, for instance, Newton's laws, and we change something, for instance, time. So if you remember time, the rate of change in time played a role in Newton's laws, and if we change the time, these laws stay the same, and this is a symmetry. So this is what we mean by symmetry. Something changes inside the physical laws, some quantity, but the laws stay the same, okay? 
So for instance, the laws of physics are the same at all times. So they're, as far as we can tell, mathematically, the ones that we use are, they're the same in the beginning of the universe and they will be the same at the end of the universe and everywhere in between. And this implies that energy is conserved. The laws of physics are the same throughout the universe. This implies that momentum is conserved. Uh, and the laws of physics, for instance, also are the same in all directions. As we look, this implies conservation of something called angular momentum, which if you don't know, it's not important. OK, so uh, finally, in this last part of the talk, I would like to talk finally about my work, which uh, I have a typo in the name. So the dynamical symmetries, yeah? So I asked myself, so are there rules that are like conservation laws, but instead of telling us what doesn't change on average, so for instance, total velocity does not change for all these particles, yeah? Is there are rules like that that tell us how things do change on average? So if we know that, right, if we knew that, we would essentially be able to compute deterministically and re in a reductionist sense the dynamics of systems that are collected, collections of large numbers of particles. Newton's laws tell us no, but I will not, I, I'm not so sure because this is a different way of looking. We are not looking deterministically anymore. We are looking at probabilities. Okay, so I will, at one point I used this flock of bird analogy. So what would a dynamical symmetry be? Well, this is a kind of, a, so this is unfortunate, I'm a mathematical physicist. So my work is mathematical and I have to present the, what I do without mathematics, uh, too much mathematics. So I'm going to use again a very uh, coarse grained analogy. Okay, so never mind what this means, the H of, com the, the H8 thing. No, no, don't mind what it means, never mind. So what is dynamical symmetry? Well, much like, <coughs> let's say we look at, we have this flock. So now we look at what three birds are doing, yeah? So we know if these three birds were alone, a conservation law would tell us that the total something stays the same, right? But now imagine that there is something that tells us how these birds, three birds will change if they're alone, but they're not alone, yeah? They have other birds around them, okay? So we cannot tell what the birds will do. But no, wait. Now, okay, each, ram each bird is kind of behaving randomly. But uh, now since we have this collection, this like rule of tree birds, uh, trees, there's nothing important about trees, just an example. Rule of tree birds here and here plus the rule here and here and here and here, how they change, how they change. We can essentially tell you, we we can compute how the flock will change, yeah? Precisely the motion of the flock, which is what we want to get, if we know this rule. And it's identifying this rule is the, in examples of systems, is uh, the focus of my work now, developing this, yeah, dynamical symmetry idea. In other words, let's say, remember there's a wave vector for each of our particles. This is the wave, this is another particle, this is a wave. And now they all talk to each other inside the system. And in the end, what we will get, yeah, when we sum up all of the probability distributions of all the electrons, et cetera, in the cat, well, we'll get up that the cat jumps up and down, yeah. Uh, so the, my basic principle, which you cannot fully read, but states, I'm gonna say it, so the particles making up the system, the whole system, apart from constraints that you have the dynamical symmetries and conservation laws, will behave as far as the entirety of the system is concerned, so the big thing, as if they're behaving completely randomly. So the thing, the big thing, will behave as though its constituent particles, apart from the dynamical symmetries and conservation laws, are just moving completely randomly. And this turned out to be enough, you can prove this for certain cla very large classes of systems, that indeed this is true, okay? So if you want to know what the big thing, you know what the cat is doing, you need to identify all the conservation laws, dynamical symmetries of the cat system, and then say, okay, the other thing is just random. Uh, th this is easier said than done, but it's a glimpse of hope, hence the title, yeah? So using this principle, we can actually, I can imagine systems that you can, I mean, 
I'm going to tell you how you can make them, but imagine systems that do very strange things, right? Because in the end, uh, this is kind of touching upon this quantum technology that we heard uh, during the introduction a bit. You don't just want to understand the properties of the real world. You want to also figure out how to make new things, new things for engineering, let's say, quantum technology. So using this principle, I can invent certain very counterintuitive uh, uh, systems of many particles. So for instance, consider this uh, video here. It is, uh, you see, the syrup is being poured into water. And as the syrup, of course, uh, will be dissipated throughout the water, yeah? And then you get, uh, I don't know, su su sweet colored water, whatever. OK, uh, but uh, you would not expect the syrup to randomly jump up and go back, yeah? So this is quite counterintuitive. It's like taking an egg, yeah? You take an egg, throw it, it breaks. You don't expect it to spontaneously reform. And this intuitive notion is what can be made mathematically precise. I'm going to do that. But its notion is of the error of time, right? Eggs break. They do not spontaneously unbreak, etc. Syrup dissolves in water. It doesn't jump back, yeah? OK, this is the error of time. And ca but can we have a quantum system using this principle that does something like this? And it turns out that yes. So something like an egg being sp that spontaneously breaks and unbreaks itself for all eternity, yeah? By itself. N we don't mend the egg, yeah? If you want to unbreak the egg, we have to go and mend the egg. But this thing will be like doing it by breaks, unbreaks, breaks, unbreaks. What's the point of this? Well, I don't know. You can do it. It's crazy, yeah? Anyway, uh, so what's the way you do it? Well, uh, so the one way you can do it is in a lab which is called the cold atom lab, where often advertised as the cold, coldest place in the universe. Indeed, there is nothing colder than a cold atom lab, as far as we know, in the universe, where you cool atoms to very near their ground states, which means minimal energy they can have. And then you use lasers, because why not? And you use lasers, and then you put lasers, and then you crisscross them, and you get something that looks like this. And then the atoms can hop around in these holes that are made of light. And if you put like lots and lots of atoms, and you make the lasers uh, such that the atoms will try to sit in this type of geometry and talk to each other like this, yeah? You can do that with lasers. That's going to be the thing. Yeah, that's going to behave like a quantum egg, this type of ladder structure. So you can make it. This can be made. Another thing is like, uh, that was all, that has not been made, by the way, yet. OK? It has not been made, the thing I just discussed. But uh, something related to this was being, was, has been made. And it has been made similarly in another cold atom lab in Zurich uh, by a uh, by a pioneer of these uh, cold atom type experiments, Timon Esslinger and Z.K. Zurich. And what they do? Well, they take these cold atoms, they put them here, yeah? And what's this? Well, these are like two little mirrors. So it's called an optical cavity. But it's really just two little mirrors. Sounds fancy, but it's just two little mirrors. And they hit it with lasers, because you have to, do, you have to hit stuff with lasers. Anyway, and then now they put the atoms inside, and what will they see? Well, they will see some very funny, and I'm gonna, not going to tell you what they exactly see, but I'm going to tell you something what they see by analogy again. Let's say you have a pendulum, yeah? Pendulum's attached to a wall, uh, and it's going to swing until friction causes friction dissipation, same thing. Friction or dissipation, just a fancy word to say friction, stops it from swinging. Now, if you take uh, this pendulum and, uh, and immerse it into, a, into water, there's two sources of friction now, dissipation. And it's going to stop moving even faster. Okay? But here, a strange thing happens. And uh, I want the, the source of dissipation in this case, or friction, is because they're using a laser. Uh, photons don't really stay inside this too long. They leak out. So this, the system is losing energy. So that's kind of the source of dissipation. And precisely because of this, this is like, this special dissipation is like a dynamically symmetric respecting type of dissipation that cancels the original dissipation. So it's like having a fluid, you immerse it here, and now it never stops swinging. 
Okay? So they make this in the lab, yeah? So these are two examples. I will, it's a work in progress, so I don't know. I will uh, conclude. So we kind of discussed <coughs> reductionism. That is uh, this idea that the behavior of large objects of many particles can be computed from the microscopic behavior of constituent particles. Uh, reductionism in the sense of Laplace, yeah, was uh, thought to be, was either thought to be wrong or depending on how you found this uh, talk, wrong uh, because of sensitivity to initial conditions, yeah, which is important, especially if you have a large number of particles. And uh, quantum mechanics, right? Even a single particle is essentially doing random things. However, due to the law of large numbers, randomness can be deterministic on average and lead to deterministic behavior. And finally, my work that I hope to do, well, I did in certain cases, due to conservation laws and dynamical symmetries, behavior of objects of many, many particles, realistic objects, can be computed from the microscopics, yeah? And yes, I thank you for your attention, and the last part is for questions. <laughs>